So with that, I, I'll uh, I'll switch over to uh, my uh, my presentation and, and get started on the discussion. Um, and hopefully this will pique some uh, uh, some questions that you might have at the end. So I'm going to talk, as Uday mentioned, about the determination of appropriate GMPs for excipients, and I'm going to touch on a lot of different things. Uh, talk about best practices, pertinent trends that are going on with regulators around the world, um, a number of uh, IPEC activities that we have, uh, and regulator expectations. So before I uh, get too far uh, into it, however, um, I'll just uh, you know put up my normal disclaimer. These are uh, my views and uh, not of any organization I'm involved in. Uh, and uh, Uday did a good job of sort of giving my background. Um, but, you know, this kind of lists uh, what I've done over the years. Um, you know, I've been in the industry for over 43 years, um, pretty much the entire time at ColorCon until um, I retired in uh, 2019. So uh, I started at ColorCon as an analytical chemist right out of college in 1977. Uh, and I was involved in uh, the quality area there for quite a long time uh, as director of uh, quality control and quality assurance. Then in 95, I became a director of global regulatory affairs and coordinated all of our regulatory activities around the world for uh, uh, many years and, and uh, spent a lot of time uh, traveling, which I love. Uh, about 70% of my time, I traveled around the world, uh, meeting many folks like you, working with regulators, uh, pharma, pharmaceutical companies and excipient companies uh, as well. Uh, in October 2019, as Uday had mentioned, uh, I started my own independent consulting firm. Uh, and uh, you know, if you want uh, further information uh, on my firm and, and what we do, uh, I got a lot of interesting projects that we're working on uh, related to excipients, food additives, color additives. Uh, uh, you can check out my website which is uh, listed there at the bottom of the slide. And if anybody needs any consulting help, I'd be glad to uh, help you. Let me know what your, your needs might be. Um, as far as IPEC, and I'm gonna go into a little more details on IPEC here in, in a minute. Um, this is my background with uh, IPEC. Uh, as Uday mentioned, uh, uh, I was one of the original founders, a small group of us in 1991. I kind of decided that uh, we needed a, a, an industry association uh, made up of makers and users of excipients to uh, try to assist regulators and pharmacopoeias uh, with excipient issues. Um, uh, we've uh, you know, expanded in many ways. I've chaired pretty much every committee that IPEC has had over the years at one time or another. I was the chair of IPEC Americas uh, in 2007 and 2009, and I've represented them at the USP convention. Uh, I'm currently uh, the rep at the Product Quality Research uh, Institute, uh, and I also uh, um, work with the IPEC Federation, which I'll discuss in a minute, uh, as the Global Expansion Coordinator. So uh, I've helped start up uh, many of the IPEC groups, including IPEC China and IPEC India, um, as well as groups in uh, Latin America and in Canada. Uh, and I'm also currently the co-chair of the Quality by Design Committee, and um, the Vice Chair for Science and Regulatory Policy for IPEC Americas. So as you can see, I've had a little background uh, with IPEC as well as many other trade associations over the years, which has got me involved in many different kinds of activities, all relevant, uh, or I should say many of them relevant to today's topic. So this is just an, a, an overview of what I'll be covering here in the uh, presentation. Um, and um, I'll be giving an uh, introduction to uh, IPEC. So those of you who are not that familiar with IPEC, you'll have an idea what it's all about. And I'm gonna talk about something called total excipient control, which is a concept that we have at IPEC about how we're working uh, together around the world to fill gaps in excipient controls that may need, be needed out there. Uh, and we have built a lot of systems around this concept. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, there's, uh, you know, a, a real need these days for increased control of excipients, uh, but making sure that those controls have the appropriate flexibility that's needed uh, for the kinds of things that we see in the excipient world. And I'll be talking about excipient realities and why excipients absolutely cannot be treated like APIs. They're extremely different than APIs. And unfortunately, and I know sometimes this happens in India, they tend to get treated as if they were APIs. And that is an absolute mistake. 
and it, you'll see more about why when I uh, talk about this in a couple minutes. I'll touch on current trends in global excipient regulation and guidance, get into some risk assessment approaches, and, and, and how that uh, helps with the determination of appropriate GMPs for your intended uses, and then what are some of the mitigation options that you might have, and sort of finish up with um, the, the importance of supplier relationships uh, in this whole, uh, this whole area. So uh, let's start with IPEC then. Uh, you know, IPEC is a very interesting organization. Uh, we're made up of really all the main excipient experts all around the world. Uh, it is a non-profit uh, non-profit trade association, but we have many diverse member companies. It's very different than most trade associations. We have folks that are involved in excipient development, excipient manufacturing and distribution, uh, many pharmaceutical companies that use excipients, both innovators, generics, OTCs. We have a number of consultants like me now, uh, uh, academics, that's like me too nowadays, uh, uh, contract labs, et cetera. And you know, what's interesting about IPEC is the combination of our members and the, the diversity of our membership really provides a full view of issues surrounding excipients, uh, which provides us with a unique capability to develop science-based guidance and position documents that really work. And it also gives us credibility with regulators around the world because they realize we are not uh, an association that really, even though maybe by definition we're a trade association, we're not about trade. We're about science. We're about patient safety. And that's that's the key thing that has given us the credibility to uh, have some of the impact that we've had around the world. And hopefully we'll continue to have even additional impact in India. So IPEC is structured like this. We have the IPEC Federation, which we set up in 2009 as an umbrella organization uh, based in Brazil. And all of the regional IPEC groups sort of uh, are part of the federation and go by uh, the, the rules that we've set up at the federation level. Uh, within IPEC Americas, uh, we represent North, South, and Middle Americas. We have partnerships, as I mentioned earlier, in Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, Canada. Um, we have IPEC Europe, uh, IPEC Japan, IPEC China, and last but not least, IPEC India, uh, which is actually the newest IPEC group. And uh, I had a lot to do with setting this up with a number of my colleagues at uh, ColorCon India, um, as well as with uh, several other uh, companies in India that uh, you know really got together and, and were able to bring an IPEC regional group to India. And they've been very successful since their startup. Uh, and uh, I'm really thrilled to see some of the things that they're doing and that they're planning to do in the near future, and I hope to be a part of that as much as possible. So the IPEC Federation, what is our mission then? Uh, it's really to promote the quality, safety, and functionality of pharmaceutical and related healthcare products worldwide, and, uh, and, and everything we do is focused on this. It's not focused on trade. It's not focused on uh, you know uh, anything related to business, and that's important because business is a separate thing. If we deal with safety, quality, patient safety, these kinds of issues, you know, good business follows. But that should be the secondary issue. It's not why we do things. Okay. Um, uh, you know, IPEC also was recently granted observer status to ICH because of the credibility that we've been able to establish over the years. And, and we provide ICH with excipient expertise to improve global drug quality. And so, you know, we're, we've been involved, we heavily were involved with ICH Q3D on elemental impurities, for example. In fact, a lot of people don't realize it, but IPEC is the group that actually made the proposal for ICH Q3D. We started that whole process with ICH. Uh, because of the understandings that we have about uh, uh, that topic and, and how it relates to excipients. We're currently involved in uh, uh, ICHQ 13 on continuous manufacturing. We have representatives on that uh, expert working group as well. So you can see we're involved in many different activities uh, that, that work towards our mission as listed here. So some of our key objectives are to manage global regulatory expectations and identify you know, emerging regulations impacting excipients wherever that might be around the world. 
uh, and establish you know guidelines, position papers, white papers, or any sort of relevant advocacy activity that's necessary. We do a lot of work in harmonization of standards. Uh, we, we, we meet routinely with the Pharmacopeia Discussion Group, the PDG, and other global, uh, global compendia uh, to continue harmonization, the harmonization process of excipient monographs. We've done a, a, lot of, excuse me, a lot of work in China with the Chinese Pharmacopeia. And IPEC India has had ongoing discussions with the Indian Pharmacopeia, where we're trying to, in, in fact, get them to harmonize uh, a little more with the global pharmacopeias as well. Um, we also develop harmonized voluntary industry guidance for global use. And that's one of the nice things is when IPEC comes out with a guidance document or a guideline, um, we already, in almost all cases, have pre-harmonized that throughout the world of IPEC. So when our guide comes out, it's already a worldwide consensus type of guide where everybody is in agreement around the world that this is how we ought to treat excipients. That's allowed us to have, again, a lot of credibility uh, with, uh, with uh, regulators around the world. And the third key topic I'll talk about here, and this kind of gets us more into today's discussion, is promoting supply chain security. And how do we look at things like excipient risk management? Uh, how can we utilize third-party certification to look at things like excipient GMPs? We've been very active in that, and I'll talk a lot more about these topics as we go forward. So IPEC's goal then is to provide tools and mechanisms to help assure that high quality excipients are produced, distributed, and manufactured into safe and effective medications globally. And like I said, our key focus is on patient safety. That's really what it's all about. So in today's world, a lot of things have changed over the last 20 or 30 years. And uh, uh, you know, it's really resulted in that we have to have improved communication. Uh, the way things have, uh, have been in the past are simply not good enough anymore. Uh, and users, makers, and regulators must take more time to understand each other's needs and controls than they did in the past. And you know, we have a changing world that is having an impact on excipients, right? We have you know, contaminated excipients from China, but also from other places. You know, we have examples where we know in India there has been actually counterfeit excipients that uh, have shown up. And instead of, you know, instead of a drum of starch that's labeled as starch showing up, it was filled with salt. Okay, uh, why somebody would substitute salt into a starch drum in the supply chain, we don't know. <laughs> but these things have happened, right? Uh, so it's not just counterfeiting of drugs, but also counterfeiting of excipients. And uh, contaminated excipients can come from anywhere, uh, even though there's been some, you know, experience with some that came from China. That's not the only place where uh, poor quality excipients come from, for sure. We have issues with bioterrorism that are out there. Uh, things like the need for more information. Uh, related to BSE, TSC, GMOs, allergens, additives, you name it, there's a much a greater need for excipient information today than there was in the past. And of course, we have the issue of cost reduction goals. You know, everybody in the pharmaceutical industry uh, has been focused on trying to lower the price of drugs and everything else, and that's a, a good objective. But on the other hand, unfortunately, what happens is these cost reduction goals many times can drive poor decisions and supply chain people or purchasing people decide hey we can buy that excipient from somebody we've never bought it from before hey it's 10 percent cheaper or 50 percent cheaper and it's from some place you don't know where it came from or exactly how it was made you don't know the gmps it was made by but boy it's a good price okay that kind of thing simply can't happen without complete supplier qualification being in effect. And we'll talk a lot about that today. And then we've also got continuous quality improvement goals that many companies have, uh, QBD, PAT type of things. And all of this is driving the need for communication about excipients in a much greater way. So this has really increased the need for better supply chain controls and traceability, as well as product consistency. So let's talk just for a minute about supply chain controls. And, uh, and I'll use the term excipient pedigree. And so I would ask all of you who are online today, 
uh, or are going to listen to this in a recorded mode, okay? Do you really know where all of your excipients or your ingredients are produced? Or do you just know the distributor, okay? And I mean all, right? This is not just about the main excipients you might use. What about that thing you only use a couple drums of a year or a, or a couple bottles of or, or whatever it might be, okay? Do you really know where they were produced? Do you know how they were distributed? And what happened in the transportation of those materials to get to your site? If you think you know that, what evidence do you have which really demonstrates this? Okay, do you have documented evidence where you can know that this is the case as opposed to just somebody telling you something? And so this is more than just a one up and one down situation where you know you get it through this distributor and you think you might have an understanding about what happened prior to that. No, it's simply not acceptable anymore with everything that's been happening. You know, you need to understand what is your weakest link in that supply chain. You need to know where it was produced, by who, who had that material at every step along the way before it came to your site. And it's simply not acceptable for any excipients that you're using for you not to have this information. So I would ask all of you to go back and think about that in your operations. Do you really have that understanding on all the excipients that you use? If not, you may want to think about how to improve your systems. So the impact of globalization has, uh, has had a huge impact over the last 20, 30 years, right? So industry really functions globally now. Now I know in India you have a lot of companies that uh, are, are more focused uh, you know, simply on the domestic market, uh, but even that's gonna be changing over the years. Many of your companies, of course, you know, do sell globally uh, your drug products, okay? And you, uh, you get your excipients globally from excipient suppliers around the world. The bottom line is the systems and the processes that many companies have or that the regulators have even, haven't adapted to accommodate globalization in many cases. Therefore, the risks related to excipients are greater than they've ever been throughout the supply chain. And we know that in India, you know, some of the regulations you have on, the, uh, on excipients, you know, date back to the 1940s, okay? They're not in sync with the way excipient controls are done around the world today. And there are some discussions that I'm aware of that are starting to happen at the DCGI, et cetera, about how maybe some of these systems can be modernized. And we think that's a great thing. I know IPEC India is going to be involved in some of those discussions, providing comments, et cetera, which is super. And I would encourage ISPE to get involved in that process as well. So the bottom line is since the risk has increased in the supply chain for excipients due to the things I've been talking about, it's critical that pharmaceutical companies, the users of excipients, they must commit to only using excipients and drug products from high quality suppliers and not just focused on lowest cost. The cost focus that has existed in many pharma companies is simply not acceptable anymore. Not that cost isn't important, but that has to be very secondary compared to making sure you're only using product from high quality suppliers. Anything less puts patients at risk. And the impact of not having high quality suppliers is patient safety risk. And that's simply not something that you can afford to do. Patient safety is paramount. And many of these recent events that have occurred have demonstrated how pharmaceutical ingredients, whether they are excipients or in some cases APIs, can cause harm when they're not designed and manufactured for pharmaceutical intended uses and not sourced through secure supply chains. It's important that these ingredients are controlled, as I've mentioned before, throughout their life cycle. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that during this presentation. To be able to have the appropriate amount of global collaboration, however, you know, we need collaborative approaches both within and between all of these organizations, industry trade associations, ingredient suppliers, distributors, regulators and lawmakers, and even criminal enforcement agencies who hold people accountable who don't buy high quality excipients, okay? 
Some of that is criminal, okay? Uh, so how do we get more collaborative approaches going on between all of these different groups? And at IPEC, we've tried to figure out what can we do to help? What can we do to improve that collaboration? And many of our efforts are developed uh, uh, so that in fact we could do this. So, you know, back in, uh, you know, I was chair of IPEC Americas uh, between 2007 and 2009. And in 2011, uh, we were, we were kind of, we were celebrating our 20th anniversary of IPEC. And, and we were talking about, you know, the previous two decades and what are we going to do for the next decade? How, you know, we thought we made a lot of difference. How can we really make a difference in the next decade? Okay. And so this was 10 years ago, you know, a decade ago now. Uh, I wrote this article as, uh, as, a, as a concept uh, for us to utilize within IPEC. Uh, to to try to think about how to structure uh, the projects and the guidelines and things that we want to develop over the next you know 10 or 20 years and it was an article I published in in pharmaceutical technology a similar article I actually published in uh, I think it was pharma biz or something in India I forget the, all the specifics right now um, but it was called you know total excipient control a pathway to increased patient safety. And the, the concept was to break down the area of total excipient control into three key areas. And those are, how do we have good systems in place for excipient design? Uh, how do we address excipient safety? How do we address excipient manufacturing, process control, and distribution? And that's the area where we had spent a lot of time prior to 2011. But we recognized we needed to get more involved in the excipient design area and the excipient safety area as well to really start filling the gaps that we might have in excipient control. So if you're interested in that article, the, uh, uh, the, the link to that article is, uh, is at the bottom here. And, you know, uh, I, I, I sent Uday the slides to, to provide to you folks uh, later on. So in total excipient control, this involves, as I mentioned, the main three areas. And within design controls, it includes how design criteria are set to meet the requirements for the intended use, taking quality by design and excipient composition into account. Uh, excipient safety would involve information which has been developed to support the safe use of the excipients in the intended applications at the levels of use expected to be experienced by the patient. And finally, again, uh, the excipient manufacturing process control and distribution, and this is the area traditionally controlled, you know, by GMPs, auditing, QC testing, information sharing, and supply chain security. And so, of course, today's presentation, I'm going to be focusing more on these areas, uh, but I wanted to let you know that IPEC also has many activities going on in the area of excipient design control and excipient safety. So. If you take a look at a lot of the IPEC guides that we have out here and we start looking at this from a supply chain standpoint, where do some of these guides fit in? What are the key things we need to think about as we, uh, as we uh, set up an excipient qualification program? And so, you know, we have some guides that are listed there. I won't go through these in detail. You can look at them later. But we have some guides that really get into how to set the right starting point for an excipient qualification program. What is some of the information that we need to understand early on before we can actually even get started? And then, you know, you need to ask your supplier and follow the chain to the manufacturer, right? And, and there's uh, various guides that we have related to excipient pedigree, information sharing uh, 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 concepts with the uh, excipient information package. And, and we have to also look at the history and the reputation of each party in the supply chain as we get this understanding and find and then understand the practices followed at each step and you can see we have uh, quite a few guidelines that we've developed over the years our gmp guidelines we'll talk about today as well as significant chains certificates of analysis excipient stability you name it related to many of the practices that are needed and then finally how do we match the risk and the controls that are needed and we have guidelines for quality agreements and risk assessment, which I'll get into more detail today. So if you look at the excipient regulatory framework, 
regulators in the US, Europe, and many other countries are now recognizing uh, that excipients cannot be regulated the same as APIs, as I mentioned earlier on, okay? Additional flexibility is needed for excipients due to the diversity of raw material sourcing, manufacturing processes, and facilities. And, and although regulators are increasingly recognizing the importance of excipients in drug formulations, they place the responsibility for excipient quality completely on the drug manufacturer. Regulators typically perform only limited oversight themselves. Now, in a few countries, uh, there's uh, some additional things that go on, but in most countries, um, it, the responsibility falls completely on the pharmaceutical manufacturer. And, and supplier qualification is to be performed by the drug product manufacturer who is fully responsible for the suppliers that they use. A good example of this is a very recent FDA warning letter that came out for an OTC skincare firm where they got this warning letter uh, and um, you know there was a number of issues and this was about uh, topicals and, 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 uh, and cosmetics. Uh, and the specific observations included the fact that they had a lack of a supplier qualification program and that they had data integrity failures related to raw ingredient uh, specification records. So you can see that even FDA now is focused a lot more on the area of supplier qualification, the need for having good supplier information on the ingredients, uh, et cetera. And again, if you read this warning letter, you'll, you'll get a lot more details to, to what I've uh, uh, mentioned here. So if we think about excipient qualification, supply chain security, and appropriate GMPs, these are really three interlinked topics. Uh, you can't separate them. They're all uh, key. Uh, to make the other ones work. And so when we think of appropriate excipient GMPs, uh, as I mentioned, there is significant pressure developing globally to hold drug product manufacturers responsible for properly assessing the types of GMPs being used to manufacture their excipients and verify that they are appropriate for the intended use in your drug product. Okay, so uh, it's not just about the GMPs that are in place. Excipient companies are going to have all different kinds of GMPs depending on their major markets, as we'll talk about. But the bottom line is the user has to determine if the GMPs in place at that excipient manufacturer are appropriate for your intended use. It may be a little different if you're using it in a topical, in oral, or maybe a parenteral product. You may need some additional controls. That's what you are responsible for. So what are some of the appropriate GMP standards that are out there? Uh, we have something called XEPACT, and I'm going to talk a lot about XEPACT uh, going forward. We have uh, ANSI NSF IPEC 363, and this is a standard that IPEC uh, worked on a lot. We also had a lot to do with developing the XEPACT standard, um, but the ANSI standard is essentially very similar in that Exapact is sort of an add-on to ISO 9001 and, and for companies that already have it to add additional GMP requirements. Uh, the ANSI NSF IPEC 363 guideline is a full standard for companies that don't have ISO 9001. So all the quality uh, system part of it is built into that guideline where that's taken care of by ISO under Exapact. And of course, then in some cases, there's other standards. Uh, like food and cosmetic standards that might apply depending on the type of excipient and the type of application that you're using. There's also the need for formalized risk assessments for excipients. And there's a document here that I'll talk in a lot more detail about in a moment called the PDA IPEC Technical Report number 546. And this is something that we collaborated with, uh, with PDA uh, and it applies to all excipients used in drug products for human use uh, at all stages of the product life cycle. So when we think about supplier qualification in the supply chain, it's critical that we have robust supplier qualification programs and supply chain controls in place. They must be established for all excipient suppliers, which take into consideration the excipient realities that I mentioned. There's 
various third-party certification programs that are out there, and some of them are highly credible, and, and they can be used to cover the physical GMP auditing aspect of supplier qualification, things like XEPAC, okay? Again, you can't qualify your supplier without having some kind of physical audit information. Getting a questionnaire is simply a useless uh, operation. Uh, it doesn't tell you anything about the real GMPs. Uh, you have to have something, either your own audit or a third party audit type of program that has gone in and done physical auditing to get the proper understanding that you need of each and every excipient to understand their GMPs. So, uh, however, it's beyond just the auditing part in supplier qualification. A robust supplier qualification program goes beyond GMP certification, and it must include things like collaboration with the suppliers to gain an appropriate technical understanding of the relevant excipient properties and the variability that might exist, and to share the planned uses of the excipient in the drug product. This is one of the big missing links that creates many problems, is drug companies will not tell their excipient manufacturer uh, what they're doing with the product. And then when they have a problem, they expect that the excipient manufacturer helps them solve the problem. But the excipient manufacturer many times doesn't even know how their product is being used. If they did, they might sometimes have told you right up front, don't use that grade. That's not going to work well in that application. We have a different grade, okay, or a different material. And so uh, that conversation has to occur early on in supplier qualification so that everybody understands how it's being used. Now, granted, you know, drug manufacturers are not going to want to provide, you know, highly confidential information, and there's no reason for that, but there's no reason you can't tell suppliers something about how you plan to use that material in terms of the type of drug product, the type of uh, processing you're planning to get into, and your excipient manufacturers can be so much more helpful to you if you share that information up front. A good, robust supplier qualification program includes that kind of conversation. It's not just about auditing and developing specifications. It's having an appropriate communication between the parties about how the material is going to be used, what are the important properties that go well beyond things like the pharmacopoeias, which is a minimum set of standards. Okay, You do need to develop appropriate specifications to meet both the regulatory and the pharmacopoeia requirements, because that's, again, sort of a minimum standard. But then even more importantly, you need to have those specifications addressing the technical performance requirements that you might have in a specific intended application. And again, this is not going to be usually covered by what's in a pharmacopoeia. This is going to go beyond that. You also need to include initial testing of selected excipients and have an ongoing routine testing program, which will verify ongoing consistency and compliance to comp both the compendial and the other specification requirements. And part of a qualification program includes understanding that excipient pedigree I talked about related to the planned supply chain. And finally, the appropriate review of the excipient information package and certificates of analysis and other documentation that could be supplied to you uh, by the supplier that may contain a lot of the critical information that you need, uh, both for use of the excipient and for your regulatory filings down the road. Uh, and again, the, uh, we promote the concept of the use of an excipient information package based on the guideline that we have, not things like questionnaires, because yes, no check boxes on questionnaires, again, generally a waste of time, not something that is very beneficial. So some of the excipient realities that um, you need to understand then. Uh, uh, to, to, to be able to put these kind of programs in place. And, and I mentioned this earlier, excipients are very different than APIs, and they absolutely cannot be treated in the same manner as APIs. Usually, excipients are mixtures made up of a number of components. They're not pure. And in fact, you wouldn't want them to be pure because most of the time, if an excipient is too pure, it won't work. There won't be any functional performance. It's the mixture and the compositional profile of the excipient that is important to give the unique functionality 
that you're looking for in that excipient. And that compositional profile may be very different from supplier to supplier for the same excipient that meets all the same pharmacopoeial specifications. So understanding the composition profile uh, is, is very important. And you also have to understand that depending on the excipient, there is always going to be a certain amount of variability that is going to exist. And that has to be accepted. Excipients usually are made for other markets and a little bit of it is being used in pharmaceuticals. And you're not generally going to be able to go to those suppliers and say, oh, you need to tighten your specification down because I need it this tight. A lot of times they're going to laugh at you and say, go buy it someplace else. Okay. You need to understand what the variability of the typical material is, and then you have to build a robust drug product formulation that can, in fact, deal with that variation so that it's not impacted by that inherent variability that is part of that excipient. In certain drug applications, such as maybe parenterals, you may have a need for excipients, which may be a little purer or less variable than the norm. Uh, and, and, you know, there may be some reasons for that, okay, but in those cases, the drug manufacturer needs to consider using special premium grades that you're going to have to pay a higher price for. You're not going to be able to just use the standard grade and say, hey, we need it pure and less variable. That's not generally going to be the case. So you've got to take that on yourself and see whether or not a premium grade may exist uh, from certain suppliers uh, that may meet your needs in those cases. So why are excipients so different than APIs? Well, they're, they're, they're very diverse materials. You know, if you think most APIs are, are, are you know, synthetic materials, very pure, 99.999% pure with a little teeny bit of an impurity, um, that's not the case with excipients, okay? We got excipients that come from all kinds of things. Uh, yeah, we have some that are made from, from chemical synthesis, things like polymer mixtures and cellulose derivatives, but many of the excipients made in these ways are much less defined than APIs because again, of, excuse me, of the type of material they are or where they come from. Cellulose materials come from trees, okay? Um, where you get the tree matters, okay? Um, we have excipients that come from mining of minerals. It's dug out of the ground. Many times, whatever is in it, when they dig it out of the grind, ground, is what's going to be in it at the end. These things don't go through a lot of purification. Uh, where you dig, even in the same mine, might matter in terms of the compositional profile. Uh, harvesting of vegetation. Okay, what's the corn crop look like? You know, what was the weather this year? That's all going to have an impact on these things. We also have formulated products, which are mixtures, co-processed excipients, uh, film coating uh, 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 mixtures of, of pigments and polymers and things, you name it, that, uh, that we have out there that, again, are kind of unique in their, uh, in their properties. We have excipients made from biotechnology and fermentation. And finally, things like animal byproducts that come into play. So the manufacturing of excipients uh, is usually done on a much larger scale than what you typically see for APIs. Uh, this is just a picture of a sort of a typical uh, large-scale uh, excipient manufacturing plant. So again, you can imagine in that kind of a plant, the amount of product made in that plant that goes into pharmaceuticals as an excipient might be a teeny fraction. It might be less than 0.1% of what they actually make on a yearly basis goes into the pharmaceutical arena. The rest of it goes into you know, industrial uses, food additive uses, you name it what you're going to be able to say as a user to, to get them to change that process is, is probably not, you're not going to be able to do too much, right? So it's very different when you're making something in that kind of an operation than when you make APIs, right? An API manufacturing facility might look a lot more like this, much more small scale, much more controlled, stain, a lot of stainless steel. Everything's, you know, you got people with gowning on, you name it, okay? Very different operation very different kind of GMPs are necessary. So manufacturing of excipients are often manufactured also by continuous production in industrial chemical facilities. And I'm sorry, sorry, excuse me about that. Um, and uh, and they're packaged in bulk. And you know, again, these pictures uh, are worth a thousand words. They kind of tell tell you you know 
all the things that you might see with various excipients that could have an impact, whether it be on the supply chain with things being shipped in rail cars or on barges, um, in big drums or trucks. Uh, again, not necessarily what you tend to see with all APIs. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. So um, let's talk now about what's going on when it comes to excipient GMPs and this area of determining appropriate GMP. So in 2015, in the EU, we saw an extremely important development for excipients in that uh, in the European directive that was put out on falsified medicines, there was a section on uh, the need for determining appropriate GMPs uh, of excipients. And uh, they then developed a guideline, uh, which is, again, just the front page. Looked, uh, uh, you can see a picture of it here that came out. And in this guideline, uh, it basically stated that all manufacturing authorization holders must determine the GMP needed for each and every excipient they use in each and every dosage form. So again, it clearly outlined that the responsibility is on the drug manufacturer but you have to determine that the GMP that is used uh, for every excipient uh, uh, is appropriate for each and every dosage form that you're using it in. So the risk assessment needs to be performed, as I mentioned, by the drug manufacturer, and there needs to be a determination of risk to patient safety, and that has to be based on both the excipient itself and that gets into how it's made and delivered, the actual GMPs in which it's, which it's manufactured, and also on the excipient and how it is used in the drug product, including the route of administration. This will involve looking at the excipient supplier's quality management system, uh, and you know why should you use a risk assessment approach? Well, again, because of the diversity of excipients that I mentioned earlier, it means that a one-size-fits-all approach to excipient GMP is simply not possible. Uh, whereas you might say, you know, ICHQ7 API GMPs apply across the board to APIs, that might make good sense. But there's no way to apply the exact same kind of GMPs, at least in detail, to excipients because of the diversity. So you have to have guidelines, et cetera, that are fairly flexible that key in on risk assessment and then have an appropriate controls to deal with the risk. So the risk assessment defines that standard of GMP that's required to assure patient safety and it's based on, again, the excipient and its intended use in the drug product, which is the key that the drug manufacturer has to look at. So we have some suitable quality management system standards that, that are referenced here. Uh, in the uh, European guide uh, as, as potential uh, standards that can be used. And I'm going to talk primarily today about three, the IPEC PQG GMP guide. It's been the basis of a lot of what we've done in IPEC. We also have the EXAPAC GMP and GMP, GDP standards that came out in 2017. And the ANSI NSF 363 uh, US national standard uh, that I mentioned earlier, although I'm not going to get into that in as much detail as the other two. So uh, the IPEC Federation uh, more recently has uh, has also put out some additional guides that can help here. Uh, IPEC Europe put out what we call the how-to document on guidelines for risk assessment. Uh, we had the PDA document I mentioned earlier, which I'll go through in a second. And then just Recently, the IPEC Federation published something called the GMP Certification Scheme and Certification Body Qualification Guide. And this is for drug companies to use when they are assessing uh, the certification schemes being used by groups like IPEC, I, excuse me, Exapact, um, to make sure that you understand that they have a high quality set of controls in how these certification programs are run. So let's talk a little bit about the PDA IPEC uh, risk assessment guide here. Uh, both PDA and IPEC collaborated to generate this guide, you know, to aid in the implementation of ascertaining the GMP for excipient uh, uh, in the guideline. 
Uh, both PDA and the IPEC Federation believe that presenting a common approach to the legal, regulatory, and related issues concerning excipients is best done as one voice. That's why they got together. And users and suppliers united together in securing uh, patient safety by coming up with this approach to risk assessment. So this busy chart, and I'm not going to go through this in any level of detail, this just shows the whole program that's outlined in the guide, uh, the complete risk model, if you will, from initiation through the various stages all the way to final risk review. But I will go through some of these pieces in a little bit more detail. So uh, here you start off, you have a need for an excipient. Uh, you need to get input from uh, the product and, and process development uh, and identify uh, the intrinsic risk factors that you might have uh, in your drug product. Now, you need to analyze this impact of the excipient then on each drug product or family and its manufacturing that you're going to use this excipient in. That is then used both to define the excipient requirements, things like the specification, but also then to do this risk assessment and come up with an excipient risk score uh, that can be utilized in the risk of the risk assessment. So first you look at the impact of the excipient on the drug product itself, the specific kind of drug product, how you're using it, the quantity you're using it, et cetera. And then you look at the impact of the excipient supply chain and you take a look at your supply chain mapping and you get input both from your suppliers you also have knowledge about suppliers that you may have had from previous experience or that you get, get through various publications, et cetera. And you define the supply chain risk factors and come up with a supply chain score uh, that then uh, generates a overall risk score. So ultimately you have the excipient risk score from your use in the drug product, the supply chain risk score that comes up with this overall risk score and then it goes into a question of, are the existing control levels appropriate? So, you know, this schematic sort of shows how that works. So if the existing control levels are appropriate, you know, then you go, go into, you know, concluding on the overall excipient risk control and acceptability, and you communicate and agree on the expectations and the use of the excipient with the supplier. However, if the existing control levels are not appropriate, then you need to take steps yourself as the user. You may uh, modify your excipient control systems. You may modify the drug product manufacturer controls internally, uh, or you may modify controls within the supply chain. So you can go back to your supplier and see whether or not things can be done there. You look at what you can do yourself in terms of maybe testing or your own processing, and then finally, um, you know, you got to look at the modif uh, modifying the supply chain if that's where the risks are as well. So sort of to generalize the, uh, the whole life cycle then, we have the excipient risk assessment, we have the supply chain risk assessment, we determine that it's acceptable, and then we implement the needed or maybe the existing controls uh, or any new controls and then ensure that these are anchored in the right way and then we have an ongoing review of this information uh, because these things can change over time. So don't forget, you know, one of the controls that you're looking at in this whole cycle is the GMP that is required. So if you want more detail on how this guide works, um, this is some contact information where you can go to these websites and, and, and get copies of this report if you're a PDA or an IPEC member. Uh, I believe uh, you can also get this report through PDA, but there is a, if you're not a member of either of these organizations, but I think there is a charge for the, um, for the report uh, through PDA. So Exapac now uh, is, uh, I'm gonna get into in more detail. So um, what is Exapac all about? Well, if you look at the EU guidelines, again, it says in chapter three, that you have to determine <clears throat> the excipient manufacturer's risk profile. So after you determine uh, the appropriate GMP, then uh, a gap analysis of the required GMP against the activities and capabilities of the excipient manufacturer needs to be performed. And you need to have data and evidence to support the gap analysis, and that can be obtained 
through audits or from information received from the excipient manufacturer, one of which can be that they have gone through an excipient certification program. So certification of the quality systems and or the GMPs held by the excipient manufacturer and the standards against which those have been granted should be considered as such certification can fulfill the requirements of uh, the European guideline. Things like an EXAPAC GMP certificate and EXAPAC audit reports and the CAPA plans that come out of those can take the place of doing audits yourself uh, to meet uh, the expectations in the European Union. We're seeing a significant interest in uh, excipient companies getting EXAPAC certified and in user companies wanting to work with companies that are EXAPAC certified already. So EXAPAC is an independent voluntary GMP, GDP standard and certification scheme for pharmaceutical excipients suppliers. Uh, the scheme was developed by suppliers and users of excipients and the scheme includes a GMP standard for excipients, which is in annex to ISO 9001, as I mentioned. It also has a GDP standard for excipients for distribution controls as an annex. Uh, it includes auditor competency definitions, a training course, exams, and registration processes that are related to ISO 17021, and the certification body quality system definition and qualification process, which is also an annex to ISO 17021. Uh, so at this time, over 120 locations across the US, Europe, and Asia have already received their EXAPAC accreditation. Uh, and and you know, if you wanna find out what companies have been certified so far, uh, you can go to the EXAPAC website and there is a list of uh, the companies that have EXAPAC certifications, all their locations that are certified, et cetera, in these countries that are shown on the map. Uh, and there's more and more companies working on EXAPAC certification all the time. So this is a very highly credible way of making sure that you're working with a company that uh, meets appropriate excipient GMPs. Um, now EXAPAC was built by the following organizations. Uh, we had the European Association of Chemical Distributors, the Pharmaceutical Quality Group out of the UK, uh, IPEC Americas, uh, I was pretty involved in this uh, through IPEC Americas, uh, IPEC Europe as well, and the European Fine Chemicals Group. So a team of over 40 individuals involved in excipient manufacture, distribution, formulation, and supplier qualification worked together to build this concept. And it started in 2008, and the first EXAPAC uh, standard uh, and scheme came out in 2012 and there is uh, the current version, uh, which was recently updated in 2017. So the way it works is, you, you know, to get your first certificate as an excipient manufacturer, you have to go through a stage one and a stage two audit. So in stage one, uh, it's uh, a confirmation of the audit duration and the preparedness of the client. So it's checking to see whether or not the excipient manufacturer is uh, prepared to go through an EXAPAC uh, uh, certification or EXAPAC audit. Uh, and then stage two is the performance of the audit and the recommendation for certification. Uh, now, an EXAPAC audit is a whole lot different than when you may go in to audit your supplier. Generally, if a pharma company goes in to audit a supplier, you're gonna be lucky if you get like a half a day, sometimes maybe a full day, uh, to go over things at a fairly high level. Right, An EXAPACT audit is usually a two or three day audit, sometimes with multiple auditors, okay, uh, that goes into much more detail than you will ever get into as a, as a customer audit of your supplier, so to speak. So that's why the credibility of these certifications is I consider it much better than doing the audit yourself even, okay? Uh, uh, so, and the auditors are highly trained in how to audit excipient plants. They're not somebody who's used to doing API plants uh, or finished drugs, and then they go into an excipient plant where they really don't have a clue what the right kinds of GMPs are. These auditors are highly trained for these uses. Uh, and, and then that certificate goes into 
uh, surveillance audit, which is a, uh, a is a three year cycle here. So in, in uh, uh, year number one, about half of the systems that uh, you have in place, quality systems, are going to be audited again. Uh, and in year two, the other half me, of your systems are going to be audited. Uh, and then in year three, you have to go back through an entire recertification once again. So, um, so again, every year the company is getting audited by Exapac against the Excipient GMP's standard in Exapac. Uh, again, this is a much more frequent type of audit situation than most pharma companies would ever uh, be able to have uh, with their excipient suppliers. So it's highly credible. So in this Exapac certification situation, you have a legal agreement between the Exapac organization and the certification bodies, and there's several of them out there that have gone through the process of uh, assuring Exapac that they can provide these uh, these uh, certification services and the auditing services. Uh, they then provide auditors who do the inspections of the excipient suppliers, and then the excipient suppliers would have an Exapac certificate. They would have the uh, the actual uh, Exapac report, the audit report, and uh, any CAPA items that they had to do, be, uh, it had that may have had to fix before they got certified, and they would have that information that they could then provide to their pharmaceutical customers. So Exapact offers uh, certificate validation, it registers the auditors, it registers the, form of the certification bodies, it provides process oversight to the whole process and transparency of how these controls are in place to make sure that only qualified auditors are doing these audits of excipient manufacturers. So you can see it's a very credible very detailed type of program. So sort of to finish up here, um, you know, uh, what happens when, uh, you know, you uh, are doing your risk assessment uh, and, you know, it is your responsibility as, as the uh, pharmaceutical user to determine whether the GMPs that are in place at the excipient manufacturer's facility are appropriate for your specific use in your drug product, right? Uh, it is your responsibility. Now, if it turns out that those GMPs uh, are maybe not appropriate for your specific use in your drug product, then it is your responsibility as the user to implement mitigating steps to address the risks that may still exist. One of the most important things I wanna stress here is this doesn't mean that you go and try to force your excipient manufacturer to change the GMP standard that they use. Unfortunately, that's what some companies try to do. They say, oh, these GMPs are not right, we want, uh, are not good enough uh, for our use in parenterals. Oh, Mr. Excipient Manufacturer, you need to increase your GMP controls. No, that's usually not gonna work. You gotta remember, many of these excipient companies could care less whether they sell to you or not. You know, and that's not the case with everybody, but in most cases, you are a very small user of their product. They mainly make the product for other markets. They are going to establish what GMP standard they want to use, and that's what they're going to use, regardless of what you say you want. Okay. Now, you can have a discussion with them about where some changes might be able to be made, as long as you're willing to also talk about potential premium costs. Okay. Um, but you can't try to force them into it because, oh, well, if you want to supply that as USP, you need to do this. That's usually not acceptable or appropriate. What happens if you try to push that too far is that usually may result, or it could result, in the excipient manufacturer, simp uh, manufacturer simply no longer supplying the excipient to you uh, because they're concerned about potential liability risks that they might have. And they simply would say, well, go buy it from somebody else. And now you're stuck because you can't just substitute another material because, again, as I mentioned, sometimes the differences from supplier to supplier are the biggest differences you can imagine. So what can be done? What are these mitigating steps that a, that a user can put in place? Okay, The excipient user could collaborate 
with the excipient manufacturer. Again, not force them, but try to collaborate with the excipient manufacturer to see if there may be some changes which can be made in the control systems that they have on that excipient that's going to be supplied to you to address some of the outstanding risks you have. This may involve some specific communication on the reasons why you need some of these changes and usually result in paying some kind of a premium price for those additional controls. And that is fully justified. Okay, don't try to get something for nothing. Another thing that the excipient user can do is you may decide to do additional testing on every batch of the excipient if that potentially could mitigate the risks. May not always be able to mitigate the risks, but in some cases it might. Uh, and this needs to include an evaluation of intra-batch consistency, however, from contain container to container due to possible excipient variability. So if you're going to use additional testing as your main mitigating step, you need to be sure that the material is homogeneous so that that testing uh, is, is representative of what might occur in some of the containers. So that, that, that may work in some cases, in other cases that are made continuously, uh, there may be some variability even within the batch that simply additional testing may not be enough. Depends on the circumstances. The user could also potentially look for a different supplier who may not have the same risk profile of the supplier that you're using. However, if you do that, it will require, again, full qualification of the new supplier's GMPs and uh, a technical and performance assessment of the use of the new supplier's excipient in the drug application itself. And that would include redoing your stability studies. You can't go changing suppliers of excipients and not address, did it impact my stability? Because in many cases, it may, okay? And so you have to include that as part of your qualification. Um, many excipients sometimes will contain additives that may be different, and you might not even know they're there, uh, they may be different from supplier to supplier, et cetera, uh, or residual processing aids, and those things can have an impact on stability. Additionally, the excipient user could perform certain processing steps themselves on the excipient to resolve the risks if possible. Maybe it's something where you could grind the material, you could screen the material, you may uh, reprocess it in some way uh, uh, where you can uh, uh, you know, get what you're looking for after that processing to mitigate whatever risk might exist. Again, it, you know, you can have a discussion with the manufacturer and see if that's something they could do for you for premium. They might be able to, but in many cases, they may say, we're not interested. It's just not enough volume to make it worth our while. So maybe you have to do that yourself or use a contract manufacturer to do it. Or the, the, the last possibility here, and again, this is, uh, uh, you know, a more extreme one, but some an option sometimes you have to take is you may need to reformulate your drug product, uh, you know, with a different excipient, and perform all the appropriate studies and regulatory filings so that you mi mitigate the risk that way. What you can't do is just accept the risk and say, "Oh, we're not going to worry about it." It might end up with patient safety concern. No, that's not acceptable. Okay. So finally, it's critical that you build supplier relationships and trust. This qualification process is not just about running some studies, setting up specifications, and looking at some paperwork uh, or doing an audit or two. It's really about developing that relationship with your supplier so that you can understand the risks, the suppliers are willing to share information with you, and you develop a trust during that supplier qualification in the drug development process, so you're truly partners in this, okay? You have to create an environment which fosters the sharing of key GMP process and technical information uh, so you can do appropriate risk assessments on the use of the excipient in your particular drug application. And a final statement I'll just make is that suppliers and users who are involved with IPEC are currently developing these excipient standards that are needed to improve patient safety, and they're not usually just following minimum requirements. So in many cases, you may wanna look at companies that are IPEC companies and find out how they're utilizing these types of systems in what they do. And if they're not IPEC companies, 
ask them why not. Ask them why they might not want to uh, get involved because I think they would find it would be a great way to improve their own processes and their own quality systems. So with that, I would just like to have uh, some acknowledgements then uh, to Dr. Ian Moore, who's at CROTA. Uh, he happens to be the president of Exapact and a good friend of mine. Um, I did borrow a few of his slides that he just presented a few weeks ago uh, about the PDA guideline that I incorporated here. Uh, and um, uh, many of his thoughts uh, are worked into uh, what I have as well. So thank you, Ian. And finally, thank you very much as an audience uh, for participating today. Uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, you being here and hopefully you found this interesting. Uh, and uh, just to finish up again, I would say if you have a need for any specific consulting work or um, uh, advice on excipient related issues, uh, please let me know and uh, my contact information is there. So thank you very much. And uh, with that, uh, Uday, I think uh, we can open it up for uh, questions for the rest of our time. Thank you. Thank you, David. <clears throat> like I said, you know, when you send me the presentation, excellent presentation, giving a beautiful overview of how pharmaceutical manufacturers should look at excipients. Excellent. Thank you. So let's see. Uh, we have <clears throat> a few many questions and we'll see how many uh, we are able to take. So first one is here. Uh, are there specific guidelines by IPEC or Exipat for different excipients to select appropriate GMP standards for group of excipients. This is to avoid subjectivity in selecting GMP standards to be applied to excipients. Hmm. Um, if I if I understand the question, what they're saying is, um, are there families of excipients that you could say need certain types of GMPs? Uh, and I would say no. <laughs> uh, That's the I, I, you know, exactly. And, and, and the reason for that is, again, everybody always wants to make things easy, right? This is not easy, <laughs> okay? There is no such thing as somebody telling you what to do. The whole point of this risk assessment model that, you know, the European Directive talks about and, and many other systems is you have to do your homework as a drug manufacturer to determine whether or not the GMPs for that excipient manufacturer and that excipient are appropriate for your specific application. So again, it's not about the excipient, it's about the use of the excipient. So the same exact excipient could be used in many different kinds of applications and need different levels of GMP, right? So if I'm gonna use an excipient, let's say in a topical, Okay, it may be that meeting the cosmetic guidelines for GMPs would be perfectly acceptable. Okay, uh, but you know, if I'm going to use that same excipient now in a parenteral, <laughs> chances are I need a different kind of GMP in, in place. Now, the manufacturer may or may not be meeting the GMPs that you need to use this in a parenteral. Okay, and if you determine in your risk assessment, that those GMPs are not necessarily uh, everything I need for my particular use, then you go into the mitigating steps that I finished with. And that's why I sort of emphasize those steps at the end. The person who's responsible for this is not the excipient manufacturer, it is you, the drug manufacturer. And you have to determine what is appropriate for your particular use. The guidelines, tell you different standards that exist. The excipient manufacturer chooses a guideline as to how am I gonna run my plant, okay? And generally that is gonna be based on either their major market or which part of the pharmaceutical industry is the target for their products. Um, and if somebody uses it in a different application, that doesn't mean I'm gonna change my GMP if I'm the manufacturer. I'm going to say this is if I follow the IPEC excipient GMPs and you say you need more, good luck with that. <laughs> Either we can talk about a premium product where I can, you know, if if it's possible for me to do additional things for you and 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 you make it worth my while, maybe we can do that. Uh, or maybe I'm not interested. Okay. And then you've got to figure out through those steps I talked about, how do you mitigate the risks that you have? 
So determining an appropriate GMP is not something that can be done for you. It's what you have to do. The guidelines and, and the standards that have been established are simply different tools that are out there that allow excipient manufacturers to decide where do they want to play, right? Do I want to be a food additive manufacturer? And that's my main focus. I'm going to meet food additive GMPs, okay? Regardless of how you're using it. If I want to sell it as primarily as an excipient, well, then you probably should be meeting, you know, the excipient, the IPEC excipient GMPs or the Exipac standard. Um, but if you need something beyond that because you're using it as a, uh, in, in maybe a parenteral application or you're using it a even worse situation if you're using it as an atypical active where maybe, you know, you feel maybe you need something like Q7, okay, uh, because you're using it as an active, well, generally the excipient manufacturer is not going to meet Q7. I can tell you that right now. There's maybe a few out there that might, most of them will tell you we are not going to meet Q7. And if you want to use it as an atypical active, that's your problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, so again, uh, you know, it, these are tools, but ultimately you have to decide what mitigating steps you need to take if the standards in place at the excipient manufacturer that they choose are not necessarily what you think you need. There's no easy way to solve that problem by saying, oh, you know, for this whole family of polymers, all you need to do is this. No, it all depends. Each and every excipient, each and every drug might be a different criteria. Absolutely. And I think people sh will have to give that amount of importance, especially when they are selecting excipients and when they are qualifying excipients. So let's go. There are yeah. very interesting questions. Uh, again, on this, you know, IPEC guidance and EXIPAT certification, there are a few questions which basically talk is, you know, like, for example, if a manufacturer is following IPEC gu guidelines while he is man manufacturing his GMP standard, does he still need to be audited? Or you know uh, how does the XCPR certification come come in between uh, those those kind of things? Yep. Well, and, and that's a good question. So I, I you know again uh, it kind of comes down to my last slide about relationships and trust, right? You as a user need to have some sort of verification that what they say is what they do. <laughs> Right, because there are companies out there that might tell you, "Oh, we follow the IPEC guides," and they might not even understand the IPEC guides, right? But they like to claim it in their marketing, right? Uh, you need to have some sort of verification that if they say they meet the IPEC GMP guide, that they actually do. Okay, and that is not generally going to be sending them a questionnaire that says, "Do you follow the IPEC guide?" Because I I'll be honest with you. As, as a person who has audited many excipient plants over my years in ColorCon, I can tell you right now that nobody puts down on a questionnaire, yes, the rust and the peeling paint is falling into the open reactor off of the roof, okay? Nobody writes that down in a questionnaire. It might be fact, but nobody writes that down, right? So the only way you get to know that kind of thing is by somebody doing some sort of physical audit. OK, now that said, it doesn't always have to be your own audit department. And that's really where things like the Exapac certification come in, is they do have highly qualified registered auditors that have an expertise in excipient GMPs and the Exapac standard who do go in and do this intensive audit that is almost like an FDA audit, right, which is a lot different than when you go in yourself, right? Um, and, and they, if, if it is going through that certification process, you can be pretty certain that appropriate GMPs to the Exapac standard are in place. Now, like I said, you may need something that goes beyond that standard for your application. That's your decision, right? But if, you, if what you need is something that meets that standard, the Exapac certification can give you uh, the kind of physical audit um, assurances that you need. Now, as a user, in today's world, I would say it's simply not acceptable to just trust without verification, <laughs> okay? You can't just assume it's okay because they say so on their website or somebody filled out a questionnaire, okay? 
uh, you need to have more than that. Now, you might ask the question, in today's world of COVID, when nobody can get out and do physical audits, et cetera, how is this being handled, right? And Exapact falls into the same situation. What I would say is the Exapact uh, program has put together in a really good set of criteria that they're using for the surveillance audits of those companies that are already certified or already in the system where they've gone through a physical audit, at least the initial audit. If they're in the surveillance system, Exapac can do virtual audits with them through a very detailed virtual audit process to make sure that the surveillance audits are continuing. However, that said, the Exapac policy on this is if you haven't been Exapac certified, you can't get into the program without first going through a stage one and two physical audit. That, and that means right now, Nobody can get involved in that program until people can travel and the auditors can get out there again. So again, you know, that physical audit is key because you got to build that trust. You got to build that verification to understand the pro programs that are in place. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Yes, it does. Now, this is a question about co-processed uh, co excipient. Uh, mm -hmm. If a co-processed excipient is manufactured by a drug product manufacturer, should this manufacturing process be performed in a GMP approved area of the facility? Are GMP requirements, including QP certification, applied if a co process excipient is manufactured by an excipient manufacturer? Okay, those are two different questions. And the one, yes. if I understand, is the drug product manufacturer is manufacturing the co processed excipient themselves. And yes. can we make it uh, in, or does it need to be made in a GMP facility? And I would say, yes, the same kind of GMP conditions apply whether you're making it yourself or somebody else is making it. Now, that said, if you're the drug manufacturer, where are you making it, right? If the question is, do I need to make it at, you know, drug product GMPs, I would say no, okay? Uh, and, you know, if you do, then that's probably more than you need, right? Uh, but you would need to make that co-process excipient in your facility utilizing appropriate excipient GMPs in the same manner as if you had your supplier doing it. Now, if I understand the second question was if the co-processed excipient is manufactured by an excipient manufacturer, what are the appropriate GMPs? that are used. Is that, is that correct uh, assessment of the second part? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, yes. So, so, so in that situation, again, the co-processed excipient is no different than any other excipient. You need to, you know, make it using appropriate excipient GMPs. Uh, now, the user still has to determine if those GMPs are acceptable for the finished product. But again, it doesn't have to be made using drug product or API GMPs. And there has been some confusion on this, and I think it might be where this question's coming from, is, you know, sometimes a drug manufacturer will actually co-process excipients as part of the drug manufacturing process itself, okay? And if you're putting together these things and spray drying them or doing whatever as part of your drug product manufacturing process, okay, uh, it, you know, that typically may be done using drug product GMPs because it's done in the same facility as you're making the drug product, right? But that that level of GMPs is not necessary if the co-processed excipient is being made by the excipient manufacturer because it's an excipient, okay? So using excipient GMPs is perfectly adequate there. Now, that said, I will tell you that there is some controversy on this point in a particular country in Europe, <laughs> okay? There's a particular regulator in a country, I won't say where, in Europe, who seems to think that co-processed excipients need to be made, you know, in the same way that a drug product is made. And that is simply not true. Nobody else around the world thinks that's true, except, except a particular regulator who has happened to create some issues and questions about this in Europe, which is one of the reasons why we don't have a general chapter 
on coprocessed excipients in the European pharmacopoeia yet. We got real close to having a, a chapter that defined coprocessed excipients over there until a particular regulator sort of got, you know, uh, uh, all in a huff about this. And there's been some ongoing dialogue about this. But, but frankly, as far as I'm concerned, that that person doesn't know what they're talking about. Okay, and I'm not afraid to say that. Uh, you know, and most people around the world understand a coprocessed excipient is an excipient. And and you know whether you're processing a single excipient or you're processing a mixture of excipients, it's still an excipient. And there's no reason why the same GMP controls are not appropriate. So hopefully that answers the question. Oh, Uday, did you put your mute on? I'm not hearing oh, you. Sorry, sorry. Oh, there we my... go. That's okay. Yeah. Now, this is a question about uh, the risk assessment and what, you know, IPEC uh, guidelines and XEPAT uh, when they do. Uh, does it do the evaluation of uh, TSE, BSE risks? If the uh, excipient is of an animal origin, is that evalu is that included in the risk evaluation by XEPAT and the IPEC uh, guidelines? Uh, not really. Okay. I mean, if you if you look at Exapact, Exapact is about GMP certification. Okay. Uh, now they will look at you know raw material controls. They will look at you know how you're developing your specification systems. They will look at that kind of stuff um, and certify that you're meeting uh, the GMP piece of that. But when it comes to something like understanding implications related to BSE, TSE, or GMO, or whatever, that really is a technical requirement. That's not a GMP requirement. So an Exapac certification would not necessarily tell you anything about TSE, BSE, GMOs. That's a topic that you would need to have a conversation about with the excipient manufacturer themselves. Uh, and, and what I would say is, you know, IPEC, we have a guide uh, on the, and I mentioned this earlier, the excipient information package, which is a standardized approach to how to share information. And in the excipient information package, there is a whole section to share information related to BSE, TSE risk, related to GMO information. And so what I would suggest uh, to users is if you don't already have an excipient information package from your supplier, you should ask for one. Okay. Now, not, you know, companies that are not IPEC members may or may not know what an excipient information package is or may not have one available, um, but you can then ask them to find out about this and maybe develop one. Um, that's a great way to share information. Now, you know, uh, some people try to get this information through the use of questionnaires, okay? And, and you know, again, that's not usually a, a real successful way of getting this kind of information. It can be a start, but uh, because a lot of times people develop these questionnaires with a lot of yes, no information. And yes, no doesn't tell you anything. What you want is information. What do they actually do, right? And what we put in the information, except the information package is, you know, more or less topics that have to be covered, and then we leave it to the excipient manufacturer to explain what they do or what they know about this situation. No yes, no check boxes. That's just a waste of time. Uh, so again, we recommend that people ask your supplier for an excipient information package that meets, you know, the IPEC uh, guideline uh, for information about this. And that would come with all kinds of information that can be helpful to you for your filings and everything else. Thank you. Now, this next question is about retesting of excipients. Does IPEC, I, IPEC have any guidelines on this? Any white paper or anything how uh, yeah, the excipient no, good, should be? Yeah, good, Go good, good question. Uh, we actually, and I mentioned this early on very briefly in my talk, we have a, a guideline on excipient stability. Uh, and so the excipient stability guideline, uh, it talks a lot about the concept of reevaluation, retesting, expiration dating of excipients, et cetera. When it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate, 
uh, how you need to think about stability with excipients. And we wrote that guideline, to be honest with you, because unfortunately, stability is an area where people, again, try to treat excipients like APIs. And they start saying, well, do you meet the ICH stability guidelines? And excipient company goes, what are you talking about? You know, I, I my, my material is, you know, iron oxide. It's like a rock. What do you mean we're going to do stability studies? I mean, it, it would be crazy to do stability studies on a lot of these excipients that are inherently stable. You know, what kind of stability study do you need on sodium chloride? <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe you need to be concerned about the packaging, whether or not moisture got in. But that's not a stability study in from a situation. So, so what we try to do in our guide is we defined materials as um, um, in three different categories. We have excipients that are very stable. We have excipients that are stable, and we have uh, excipients that may have limited stability concern. Okay, and and so what we've done is we've actually set up some criteria for those three different categories of stability as it relates to excipients in the excipient world and said, well, first you need to understand where does your excipient fall, right? And get information from your supplier. If it is something that is an excipient that is very stable, you know, you should talk to your excipient manufacturer about why they know that, okay? It may even be something as simple as it's in the literature. <laughs> you know, this chemical has been around for a hundred years and everybody knows it's completely stable, like sodium chloride or iron oxide or something, right? You don't need a formalized stability study to keep re-justifying what everybody already knows, right? Um, uh, and find out, well, what information exists that you can use to justify your situation? Uh, if it's something with limited stability, okay, maybe there you're going to need to have some sort of stability study information to to understand the situation. And then within the guide, it it uh, it talks about for each different category, you know, what kinds of things you may want to consider as you look at whether or not you need an expiration date or not, whether or not you need a retest or reevaluation date or not and maybe something about the frequency that you might want to use, right? So, so uh, again, that guideline can provide a lot of good guidance. And, you know, uh, and I know sometimes in India, this has been a problem where even, you know, regulators and, 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 and in customs, you have these expiration date mindsets and it has to have 60% of the shelf life left to be, you know, get through mm -hmm. customs. I mean, frankly, that's ridiculous, okay? <laughs> that's what I was and, telling and, you, it's very prescriptive. Exactly. And, 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 you know, that, that kind of thing, it kind of gets back to one of my early slides, a one size fits all can't be applied to excipients. You can't simply sit there and say, we need all the stability information on all excipients. You might be able to do that on APIs, but excipients makes no sense. So to be honest with you, as I mentioned earlier, this is one of the areas that IPEC India is going to be talking with the DCGI on that they need to get rid of this 60%, you know, shelf life concept on excipients and the whole way in which they deal with stability and retesting on excipients. Now, I'm not saying there aren't times when you need a good retest program and, and maybe even expiration dates on some of these things, but it depends on the material again. And, and our guide tries to outline, you know, a lot of information that can be very helpful to people to set up a, a good scientifically based program. Uh, now, also, I would just say, you know, we just I just got done three days of IPEC committee meetings that we had the last three days. Uh, and one of the things in our um, GMP committee that we're looking at is is possibly looking at an update to our excipient stability guide to bring in, you know, so, some of the more recent discussions that are going on there, because I think we wrote that back in 2010 or 2012, I forget. Uh, so it's been a few years. So, you know, we periodically do update these guides to bring in any new information that might exist, et cetera. So, uh, but again, for whoever asked that question, if you are interested, you can get all the IPEC guides for free, okay, from the IPEC websites. There's no charge on IPEC guides. And you sometimes have to figure out where to go in on the website to get it. Um, but again, if somebody has problems with that, let Uday or me know and we can guide you to, or I can help guide to, to where you can get that information, whether it be through IPEC India or IPEC Americas, 
uh, or the Federation itself. Thank you, that's great. So I think there are still several many questions, but we'll take one last one, uh, which is, you know, uh, related to risk assessment and when you are actually evaluating what are the quality parameters required for an excipient. And at that stage, when you're developing your formulation, when you're developing your product, you need, and if you're using quality by design principles, you need to conduct number of small scale experiments uh, to see the variability of the, uh, what is the effect of variability of the excipient on your formulation output. Yep. So in this case, IPEC, Exipad, are they doing something so that, you know, manufacturers are able to get uh, excipients, one is on small scale, and secondly, with different varying characteristics. I mean, if you if you want uh, excipient with different particle size or different polymorphic uh, characteristics, great question. Those... I, I I know exactly and where you're going. The... It's a it's a great question, and 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 I got a lot I can I can tell you about. Okay, this issue of how do we get samples to do my design of experiments uh, when doing a quality by design uh, development process uh, has always been or has been a, a big topic of discussion for a number of years because unfortunately you know users again not understanding some of the limitations that might exist with excipient companies right. what, what typically happens is users and I know this happens a lot in India okay users will come to their suppliers and say we need three samples at the low, middle, and high of all these specifications so that we can evaluate this. You're never going to get those samples, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're never going to get those samples. Excipient manufacturers typically do not manufacture their product at the limits of specification. They might have some batches that come out there once in a while, but they're not made by design, right? And so there's a few manufacturers who may have saved samples and developed like some QBD sample kits and, and that kind of thing that may be helpful. Uh, but again, those samples are generally made up of not only their, their GMP materials, but they may be made up from materials made in their plant of all different grades that, you know, to try to get samples like that. So, so what we did a number of years ago uh, is, um, you know, I, I co-chair the Quality by Design Committee for IPEC, okay? And so we were trying to figure out what can we do to help in this area? And, and you know, there are other techniques that you can use to evaluate variability beyond just getting samples at the high, middle, and low. And so what we did is we developed a guide. Uh, it's called the QBD Sampling Guide. And this guide talks a lot about, again, the excipient realities, of what you can expect and what you shouldn't expect, okay? And what can you do with what you can get? How can you uh, ask for maybe different kinds of samples? Maybe you're gonna not get samples of the grade that you get at low, middle, and high, but maybe let's, for example, uh, microcrystalline cellulose, this is a good example, it comes in various different kinds of particle size grades. Maybe you get the grade below and the grade above the grade that you use, and you use them in your design of experiments, and those are sort of worst case scenarios. And if your process and your product you develop to be robust to those differences, now you know that any difference that occurs within the standard specification of the grade you'd actually use is not gonna be a problem. That's just one example of one of the techniques. So in the in the QBD sampling guide, we outline a, a whole number of techniques that can be used with the samples that you might be able to get uh, to develop a design of experience, uh, experiments uh, that might get to this point of, of variability. The other thing that we're actually doing right now is, and we just talked about this yesterday, we had our QBD committee meeting yesterday afternoon. OK, is we're going to have a new project where we're going to try to develop some sort of a communication tool that can be used between makers and users right up front during the qualification process that will speak to excipient variability. So instead of finding out about it afterward with samples or when you have a problem in production, you can right up front as part of your initial excipient selection and qualification process, make sure that you understand the kind of variability that may exist. And that may 
determine whether you even want to use a certain excipient or which supplier, or whatever. So that's something that's currently going to be developed in the future. But the last thing I'll mention on this is we have the QBD sampling guide that we put out in 2016. Again, available for free on the website. Okay. Uh, however, we just launched our overall excipient QBD guideline uh, that just got published and in fact I believe is going to be available to the public starting this month so it's, it's either already available or it will be within the next week I think uh, and this is is a large guideline that talks about everything you need to know related to QBD and excipients and it took us seven years to develop this guide <laughs> okay we had experts from many excipient manufacturers many high-level QBD folks from the pharma industry, et cetera. Uh, and we believe this guide is going to be an extremely useful guide for people to understand what they need to know about QBD as it relates to excipients and excipient variability, uh, et cetera. And so this guide is either already available within the last couple of days on the excipient uh, or the IPEC website, or it will be very shortly. And I strongly encourage anybody who's in the formulation area uh, make sure you take a look at this because the whole concept we had is what do you need to know to build a robust formulation and how do you think about excipients and that's the purpose of this guide. So hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. It, yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for this. Excellent maybe uh, one last one last thing you day I, I might mention is maybe the QBD guide would be uh, another uh, webinar that we could do down the road because to be honest with you. Uh, myself, Chris Morton, who you know, and you may know Brian Carlin from DFE as well. I'm not sure. The three of us just presented a IPEC webinar on the launch of the new QBD guide uh, back in January. And uh, you'll you'll find this very interesting, as I think the rest of your participants will, is that we had a representative from the FDA who attended our webinar on the new QBD guide, was so impressed with what they heard that they came to us the same day and said, we want you guys to present that webinar to the FDA as part of our educational process for our reviewers. And so in May, Chris and Brian and I are gonna do the same webinar that we did with IPEC with the FDA to educate them on all these points related to excipients and QBD and the new guide okay, which we think is going to be a great opportunity to kind of get everybody on the same uh, page with this. And that Absolutely. webinar that we did back in January, if somebody is interested in getting a, a quick look at that, uh, you know, we recorded that webinar and that webinar is available for a nominal fee. It's not a lot. Uh, and, and so if anybody is interested in getting that, you can go to the IPEC America's webpage, look on the the uh, excipient learning lab page there and you can uh, access that for again a small nominal fee it's under a hundred dollars it's like 50 bucks or something or 25 i forget um if you want to see what we're going to present to the fda because we're basically going to present almost the same thing with maybe a little different twist uh slightly uh to probably hundreds of fda reviewers uh in may so uh again this might be something that you know i might be able to do a, a shorter version of that or something uh for you uh, if you want uday down yes. the road uh, where i yes. can take advantage of the slides that we already developed and present that here for ispe if there's interest in that as well absolutely i was just going to come to that because there is a lot of interest in in that in determining how we you know how to capture the excipient variability as it affects to the final formulation and how to go about that and i was just coming to that good you took words from my mouth and we will do that somewhere in month of may you know you let me know when you have all three of you have time somewhere in second, third or fourth week of May, once your FDA presentation is over, we can do it. Or if May is not convenient, we can do it uh, yeah. anytime afterwards. But we will definitely do okay. that because that's that's very interesting uh, uh, for this. So let me thank all the delegates for joining today. It was slightly late, but uh, we are happy with the numbers who have attended about 150 or so and rest of the 1200 people would get the recorded version and before we say good evening and good good night to our uh, delegates and
before we meet next week for another interesting webinar. David, again, I will hand it over to you to say final words uh, to the delegates so that you know we say them goodbye. Over to you for uh, your final you. words. Thank you very much. So, so again, I hope everybody found this interesting. Uh, maybe get you thinking a little bit about excipients in a different way than you did before. Uh, again, I appreciate you guys uh, uh, hanging out on a, on a Friday night to listen to what I have to say. Uh, and uh, you know, when it comes to some of these developments that seem to be starting in India to possibly modernize the regulations and the regulatory framework to address excipients in a different way, I would hope that everybody in the pharmaceutical industry in India would be supportive of that and get involved. Don't sit back and let somebody else do it. Get involved with through your advocacy folks, et cetera, your trade associations, work with the DCGI and the other regulators and see whether or not we can get the systems in India to uh, harmonize to some degree as it relates to excipients with what pretty much the rest of the world is already doing. And, and I think they would find great benefits in doing that in terms of patient safety, in terms of uh, improvements in industry uh, to drug quality and certainly uh, help in uh, you know controlling the costs that are involved in some of these things so thanks again have a great uh, great weekend or rest of your day uh, or evening over there wherever you're at and uh, I look forward to presenting uh, to you in the future maybe on QBD today so we'll, we'll talk more about that down the road yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, delegates, for joining today. Have a good weekend, and we'll meet next weekend for another interesting session. With this, we are closing this webinar. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.